darkness Don't worry Just lay it down, it's not your fight Don't worry It'll be alright Don't worry He will make your heavy light Don't worry at all, worry at all Cause love is always right on time I've been trying to figure out my own way Trying to put it all on me Way down by the pressure Without looking up, I know you see me Cause on and on and on you keep blessing me But on and on and on I keep worrying Why I'm always running when you're telling me you're Telling me don't worry Just lay it down, it's not your fight Don't worry, it'll be alright How many of you are voting? We do this every Sunday now. Okay, great. Everybody, their hand up. Just volunteer to be part of the dance team. Let's take get their names real quick. Uh, Y'all can go ahead and have a seat for just a moment. This has been a week full of lots of great things. If you have never volunteered for VBS, I suggest next year is your year. If you have, please keep helping. This year, we had over 400 kids and over 200 volunteers. So there was over 600 people in this building and on this campus Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday night. And I'm not even counting all the people who came up the weeks before to help build and set everything up. There's a lot that goes into VBS, but there's a reason for that. It's because there's a lot that we need to pour into these kids. That's right. Um, our students have worked their tails off dancing, so if you want to come take their place, I can't do that. I can't breathe that well. I was told not to do the box jump because Ryan says our workman's cop won't cover that. Like, okay. Um, but this has just been a little taste, that worship song that we did, the kids coming down front, just loving to enjoy the Lord and celebrate um, the dancers, the kids love to, the kids love to emulate and learn the dances with the students for the week. I've said this before I even came on staff at Aldersgate. You can always tell where Aldersgate has been because all the youth groups will emulate the dances and learn the dances. So if you see dances going on at a youth event, it's more than likely our kids' fault, among with other things, I'm sure. So all that to say, our kids are important, right? And we wanna make sure that we keep pouring into them. This has just been a little snippet, and I wanna show you a little bit more of some of the other things that went on this week. Check out this video.
Wasn't that great? Yeah. So if you volunteered this week, we just want to say a huge, huge thank you. If you are new to Aldersgate and you have a passion to work with kids, we would love to get to know you, talk to you about how to help out in the kids ministry. If kids are not your jam, I've got four of them. So sometimes I want to stay away from kids for a while. Maybe students are what you love to do. Maybe college age students are what you would like to help with. Maybe the worship team, the front of house, the pre-K ministry. There's so many places at Aldersgate we have for you to get involved. If you are new here, we wanna connect with you. In the backs of the chairs in front of you, there's a card, it's, we call it our connect card. We'd love for you to take that right now, fill it out, let us know that you were here. On your way out, there are black boxes hanging on the walls uh, by the doors. Those are our giving boxes. If you are an owner at Aldersgate, that's also where we want you to drop your tithe, um, your offerings. We don't ask for tithes or offerings because we need the money. We ask because we love to do things like this, and it takes resources to do that. So whether it's our time, whether it's our uh, finances, we want to be able to give in those ways. Um, we have been in on a, a series called Overcome, and what we see every year when we invite hundreds of students and kids into this building is that we're not the only ones trying to overcome things, adults. We have kids that are working to overcome lots of hard things in their life, and it gives us the opportunity to minister to them and give them a touch of Jesus for that week. And so if you've been walking through this series with us, you know that we've walked through several different things. Um, I want you to watch this video right here, just kind of get a little taste of what we've been talking about. If you haven't been here, check this out. Once upon a time, in a land far, far away, there was a character. He had lots of adventures. Some of them were good, and some of them were bad. But at the end of the day, he learned a very important lesson. And he shared that with each of you. This has been Storytime with Michael. Y'all give it up for Sam. So here's the deal. Each one of us is captivated in many ways by stories. Uh, we, from a very early age, we love to hear stories. In fact, one of the, the evening routines that many of you uh, have done at some point or are currently doing with your children uh, is reading or telling a bedtime story. And when we think about stories, we're captivated by uh, maybe different types of stories. Some of you like action stories, and some of you are maybe more drawn to drama and suspense, where some of you love a good romance story. At the end of the day, though, we all love stories. But there's something that happens when we begin reading children's stories, especially as an early age. Uh, we, we hear a story very similar to the one uh, that I just told you. We're introduced to a character. That character uh, interacts with his world in some way, uh, learns an important lesson, and then the story is over. Uh, however, as stories continue to uh, mature and continue to um, develop as we get older, there eventually becomes a very key component that is absent from most children's stories that is almost always present <coughs> in every other story, and that is the introduction of a villain, the, the bad guy. Uh, sometime in that progression from uh, reading to a, a toddler or a baby into reading to a child, uh, eventually we learn the idea of a bad guy, uh, that there's someone who is out to either get the hero or is against whatever is happening. And so we, we are introduced to the villain. And in our story, we know that uh, the villain is not good, 
uh, is often bad, uh, corrupt, and it helps us understand that one of the things that draws us to a good story is this disparity between good and evil. Uh, that we know that oftentimes that battle between good and evil is what sucks us in. Uh, most of the time in our stories, uh, the good guy wins, right? Um, in fact, oftentimes when we're processing through a story, uh, we kind of know before the story's over, okay, like it looks bad right now, but I know how the story, the good guy is gonna win in the end. Uh, I was uh, actually reading an article this week that was talking about how often in uh, Europe, um, in a lot of the European uh, books and movies and productions that are being put out, a lot of the times the good guy doesn't win. Uh, and I think that's, that's sometimes hard for our Western culture because we've been trained that when we look at a story, when we read a story, when we watch a story, when we listen to the story, we know that eventually the good guy is going to win and good is going to win out over evil. Uh, but we continue to get drawn into this story. Uh, and we know that, that oftentimes when the good guy doesn't win, we, we get this kind of pit in our stomach that we're just like, um, I, don't, I don't really know what to do right now, right? Um, one of the, the best uh, storytellers out there that's in the world uh, today is the MCU, the Marvel Cinematic Universe, uh, that have given many of our heroes that we beloved and we cheer for and things like that. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and throw a spoiler alert out there. If you haven't seen Infinity Wars, you've had a year and a half, so I'm not going to feel bad about this. But in Infinity Wars, uh, we're, we're watching the story play out. And in the midst of that story playing out, there's a bad guy. There's a, a villain that's introduced. His name is Thanos. Uh, and Thanos' uh, job, his goal, his objective um, is to wipe out half of the known universe, wipe out existence uh, for half of the people that are living in all of the universe. And at the end of Infinity War, when you're sitting there cheering on the Avengers, you're cheering on the Guardians of the Galaxy, you're cheering everybody on, and at the end of Infinity War, Thanos wins. And he achieves his goal. I know, shocker, right? And you, you, I, I remember you may be like me when you were watching Infinity War and you like, were sitting in the theater, like, I just felt sick. I was like, hold on. Like the credits are playing and I'm like, no, this is not how this works, right? Like the, the, the bad guy is not supposed to win. And I sat there after Infinity War and was just like, um, I, don't, I, don't, I don't really know what to do now um, because this is not how the story ends because evil won out over good. Um, and obviously they had another movie to, to go and so eventually the story comes to a glorious conclusion. Uh, but in that midst of that, like, we struggle with this idea of, of evil being victorious over good. Um, but this morning, we're going to walk through this idea of how do we overcome evil with good? Like, how do we as Christians live our life, and how do we continue to walk through this life that we live in a place where we're allowing good to be victorious over the evil around us. And so I want to walk through a couple observations uh, that, that kind of help us understand maybe where uh, the scenario for us is currently and how we can live in this world that we exist in. Uh, the first thing that you have to come to grips with, you have to accept, you have to go, I'm okay with this, is that evil is real. Like evil exists. Evil is not some like foreign concept. And a lot of times when we're raising our kids, we want to raise our kids in this safe environment. We want to put them in a bubble and we want to say, hey, I want to protect you from the evil that's out there. I don't want you to know about the existence of these evil things that are out there. Uh, a couple months ago, I started watching a, a show that may be familiar with called Criminal Minds. Uh, and Criminal Minds follows the uh, behavior analyst unit of the FBI, and their sole objective is to track down and catch serial killers. I mean, some of the most evil, vile, corrupt things. Uh, and as you're watching through the episode, many of you are probably like, I don't want to watch that because it, it is filled with just these awful scenarios of people doing uh, atrocious things to others. And it as I was watching through this over the, the last couple months, like it helps me realize, you know, that, that this is a TV show, but it's a TV show representing a very real evil uh, that exists in our world. That there are people out there uh, who don't embody what we might embody in the characteristics that we want to show the world, but they embody this thing that is just 
awful and makes you feel sick to your stomach. And so when we think about examples like that, we go, okay, that's evil. That's like the pure epitome of evil. But I want to help maybe introduce you to a, a, a better concept of, of what evil really is. We're going to go back to the very beginning of the story of the Bible. We know that Genesis gives us this introduction to the story of God's interaction with his creation, with humanity. And in the beginning of that story, God creates, and he creates uh, all of the existence, and he creates the plants and the animals, and he eventually creates man in his own image. And then he begins to interact with humanity. He begins to interact with Adam and in Eve. And it says in Genesis chapter 2, verse 9, it says, And out of the ground the Lord God made to spring up every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life was in the midst of the garden, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. If you remember from the story, God said, hey, you can have anything in this garden. Everything is yours, but do not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And, and so he tells them that you can have everything you want except for this. And in the midst of that, uh, we know that the story goes on. In chapter 3, verse 5, Satan comes to tempt uh, Adam and Eve, and he begins to talk to them. He says, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be open, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. And so Satan's basically saying, hey, did God really say that? Because what God knows is what he doesn't want is he doesn't want you to know the difference between good and evil. So the twist and the, uh, the deception that Satan throws out there. And then we know that Eve eventually takes from the fruit and she gives it to Adam and Adam takes from the fruit. Their eyes are open. They, know, they now know the difference between good and evil. Then God comes back into the story. God comes back into the garden. He begins to interact with Adam and Eve. And in verse 22, he says this, And the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us in knowing the difference between good and evil. Now lest he reach out his hand and take also the tree of life and live forever. And he casts them out of the garden. And he begins to uh, put certain stipulations on how we interact with humanity or how, how God interacts with humanity. And so we see that from the very beginning, there was the, this, this difference, this concept that separated good from evil. In the beginning, Adam and Eve did not know that. They didn't have the knowledge between the difference of good and evil. But when they took the fruit, they now could see, they could understand, they could know that difference between good and evil. And so we have to, from the very beginning of time, we have to understand that evil is real. And a lot of times we want to live in this safe uh, candy corn, candy cane, cotton candy, rainbows universe that keeps us safe, right? That we don't acknowledge the existence of these evil things, these things that are not who God is. And you have to understand from the very beginning of time, everything that was good was a reflection of the characteristics of who God is, right? That we understand that good represented this reflection of God and evil represented anything that was not the reflection of who God is. And so we sit there and we go, well, yeah, evil are those atrocious serial killers. Now, evil is anything that I do that is not representative of the characteristics of who God is. And so we know that evil is real, that evil is around us every day. All these things that do not represent who God is. Evil is real. But we also can hold on to this one good, holy, true fact in that God is good. God is good. And a lot of times when we're processing our life, some of you may be in this room and you're struggling with this fact of like, man, nothing in life is good. Everything is terrible. Everything feels like it's crashing down around me. I hope you hear this morning that God is good. And that everything that, that the characteristics of who God is, is embodied in this goodness of who God is. We recognize this because in the midst of all this evil, in the midst of the, the beginning of the story in Genesis, we get to see this play out in a very heartbreaking way. Look at Genesis chapter 6, starting in verse 5. It said, The Lord saw the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Like this right here is just hard for me to concept that Adam and Eve are here 
They're in the garden walking with God in the cool of the evening, right? And then they take, and they now know the difference between good and evil, the reflection of everything and the characteristics of who God is, and then everything that does not reflect that. And five chapters after that, it took us five chapters as human beings to like take the whole world to crap, right? Five chapters later, that the only thing that was coming out of man's heart was evil. The only thing that was being coming out of the, the, the intention and the actions and the heart of man was only evil continually. So that, verse six is in the Bible, that the Lord regretted that he made man on the earth and it grieved him to his heart. Because not of the image of God, remember man was created in God's own image, not because we were the image of God, that's not what broke God's heart. What broke God's heart is the condition of our heart was continually choosing evil over good. And got to a point that God regretted creating human beings. He regretted creating humanity because of the evil that was inside of us. So God makes a decision in verse seven. So, so the Lord said, I will blot out man whom I've created from the face of the land, man and animals and creeping things and birds of the heavens, for I am sorry that I have made them. God got so heartbroken, not because of what we looked like, but because of the condition of our heart, that he said, I'm gonna wipe humanity off the face of the planet. But... Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. So God was prepared to wipe out every iota, every ounce of humanity on the face of the planet. But Noah began to let God show us and reveal to us the goodness of who God was. Because Noah was a righteous man. Noah was a man who was not reflecting the evil and corruption of the world, but instead was reflecting the glory and the goodness of who God was. And so if you know the story that if you go on in Genesis chapter six, that the flood comes and Noah and his family are saved uh, and they begin to repopulate the earth to see the remnants of who we are today. And we get to this point where we get to see in the midst of God's greatest heartache, in the midst of God's greatest regret in creating humanity, He said, I see good in that one. And that's worth continuing on. That's worth fighting for. That's worth putting together a redemption process that later comes to the fullness in Jesus Christ. God said, that's good. That is a reflection of who I am. And so we know that evil's real. We don't, we don't live in a, in a glass box that we, we were protected from everything. We know evil is real, but we know God is good. And so what I want to propose to you this morning is this idea that every day we have a choice to make. Every day we get to make a choice in how we're going to interact with the world around us. Are we going to interact with this world reflecting the goodness of who God is or allowing the desires of our heart to lead us and pull us and strain us away from God to the evil and the corruption of this world? That is the story that you live in every day. Every day you live in a story that you're turning the pages to a new chapter. You're turning the pages to a new storyline to say, how am I going to interact playing between good and evil today? And I want to help you understand maybe how to do that. How do we fight that? How do we make that choice every day? Martin Luther King put it this way, darkness cannot drive out darkness. Only light can do that. Hate cannot drive out hate. Only love can do that. And we recognize from 1 John, the whole book of 1 John talks about this idea, introducing this concept that God is love. And anything that embodies love is actually reflecting the goodness and the glory of who God is by showing love. And so if we want to get to a point where every day we're choosing good over evil, we're choosing that, it's how we love others, how we love and embrace the world around us. 
Luke chapter 10, Jesus is interacting with uh, some people and the disciples and uh, some, some teachers and, and different people from the, the community. And as he's doing that, uh, someone asks him the question, hey, how do, I, how do I get eternal life? Like, how do I live uh, with God and how do I have eternal life? Uh, and as they're kind of processing through that, uh, he says, hey, what's, what's in the law? What, what, what does the, the scriptures say? And one of them answers from the Shema, which is uh, the, the Jewish way of, uh, of, of how, what they would recite to uh, understand their beliefs and acknowledge their beliefs. Said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. The way I boil that down is love God and love people. And for a number of years now, I've printed shirts, and we've got shirts out there right now uh, that say that because that to me is one of the mantras that I live my life by is how do I get to a point where I can love God and love people? And that comes straight from the page of the scripture. So Jesus, uh, after they say that to him, he says, you've answered correctly, go do this and you will live. And in the midst of that, this person comes back to Jesus and he's trying to trick him up. He's trying to, to get him to twist his words. He's trying to say something that wasn't politically correct. He says, well, And justifying, verse 29, and desiring to justify himself, said to Jesus, and who is my neighbor? And Jesus replies with this story. He said, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he fell among robbers uh, who stripped him and beat him and departed, leaving him half dead. And so you've got this person who's just going along. uh, He's beat. They take everything from him, and they leave him on the side of the road half dead. Now, by chance, Pastor Ryan was going down. Oh, no, that's not what that says. Now, by chance, a priest was going down by that road, and when he saw him, so he's walking down this road, and when he saw him, he passed on the other side. And I know Jesus included this because a lot of times we sit there and go, oh, well, the, the, the pastor, the minister, that person is, is elevated to a higher place. They respond to the world differently than the rest of us do. And Jesus is saying, no, 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 that same pastor, that same priest has to make that choice to say, how am I gonna interact with the world around me? Am I gonna choose good? Am I gonna choose evil? And it says that he passed by on the other side, said, hey, I, I don't really wanna have anything to do with that So I'm going to mind my own business and I'm going to go this way. It goes on and says, uh, likewise, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, also passed by on the other side. A Levite, that's that's a religious person. That's someone who was probably a good churchgoer, like many of you, comes to church, raises their kids in church, ties regularly, does all the things to check the boxes to say, hey, I am a spiritual person following after Jesus. Yet that same person now gets to a point where they go, I have to figure out how am I going to interact with the world around me? And the Levite makes the choice also to say, you know what? I don't want to have anything to do with that, so I'm going to walk over here and I'm gonna to choose to mind my own business and go my own way. But then, in verse 33, a Samaritan, as he journeyed, came to where he was, and he saw him, and he had compassion. Now, if you don't know the, the, the historical context, uh, a Samaritan was a person uh, who were essentially mortal enemies with Jews. They hated each other. Uh, I mean, you think about uh, your worst school rival, and you're just like, oh my gosh, if I saw that person right now, like, I, it would just not be pretty. We'd have a fight right here in church, because I hate that school. I hate that person. Like, 10 times worse were Jews and Samaritans. Like, they hated one another. And so this Samaritan had every right as he's walking down this road to recognize that Jew and have hate for that person and say, you know what? You deserve that. That's what you needed. You, you, you're in the place where you're supposed to be and I'm gonna walk over here because I'm a Samaritan and I'm better than you. This, Jesus tells us that the Samaritan saw him and he had compassion which compassion is one of those characteristics that is also used to describe God. And so compassion is a reflection of the glory and the goodness of who God is. And so the Samaritan had compassion on this Jew. So he went to him, he bound up his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he set him on his own animal and he brought him to the inn to, uh, and took care of him. And the next day he took out two denarii And he gave them to the innkeeper saying, take care of him and whatever you spend, I will repay you when I come back. And Jesus says to the people that are on looking, he says, which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell among robbers? 
And he said, the one who showed him mercy. Now we've seen compassion. Now we see mercy, another uh, characteristic of who God is and how we look and describe God. And Jesus said to him, you go and do likewise. Go and do likewise. I, I think it helps us understand so much of the story when we process through this idea because we see a story and we go, okay, hey, I can, I can relate to that. There's people in my life that maybe I don't always connect with or whatever. And what Jesus didn't do is he didn't outline step for step what we're supposed to do, right? Jesus didn't say, okay, when you're in this scenario, you need to go uh, wrap up his wounds, take him to the inn, give the innkeeper two denarii. Hey, if you spend any more, I'll take care of that too. And then you can wash your hands and be clean. He didn't do that, did he? He didn't say, hey, when you come across this coworker who's talking badly about you, here's how you should approach it, step one, step two, step three. He didn't do that. Instead, what he did is he said, I want you to look at the characteristics of who God is, the goodness of who God is. Understand that you are a reflection of that goodness. Now go and do likewise. So if someone needs mercy from you, show them mercy. If someone needs grace, that they've wronged you and you have every right to say, you wronged me and here's what you owe me. Instead, you say, you know what? God showed me grace, so now I'm gonna show you grace. If someone needs love, you say, hey, can I love you today? Can I show you and shower you with a love that maybe you haven't experienced in years? If someone needs compassion and, and they have no one to fight and be an advocate for them, you say, hey, I wanna have compassion and I wanna be an advocate for you. He didn't say, here's your one, two, three step plan in how to overcome good with evil. What he said was go and do likewise. And so as you're walking through your life, as you're going through day to day, how do you need to show and reflect the glory and the goodness of who God is? Because here's the harsh reality, evil is real. And we know that. We see that around us every day in all kinds of different scales, from the smallest to the most atrocious things. We know that evil, the things that don't reflect the goodness of God, are real. But we also know that God is good. That when we pursue after him and we worship him and we praise him and we listen to his words in our life, now we begin to be a reflection and we begin to be what God originally created us to be. He created us to be a reflection of the goodness of who he is. Why do we know that? Because we were created in the image of God. And so now we are living into that embodiment of saying, I'm a reflection of God. I am following after him. And I am now doing the things that God would do for the people around me. And I'm walking into that idea of every day I have a choice to make. Am I gonna live today saying, go and do Likewise, Heavenly Father, God, we thank you for the fact that we can look into the story of who you are. God, we can, we can read in the pages of scripture all of the characteristics of who you are. We can see love, we can see mercy, we can see grace, we can see compassion. We can see things that, that maybe sometimes are difficult for us to do. We can see things that are maybe difficult for us to have the patience for. But God, as we look around and we see the evil that exists in our world, God, my prayer for us is that we begin to see, not through our own eyes, not through our own patience level, not through our own uh, frustration limit, but instead we begin to look at the world around us through your eyes, that we begin to see people with the way, the, the, the love that you have for them, that we begin to see people with the mercy that you showed them. God, we begin to see ways in which we can give people grace and have compassion for the people in our lives that maybe we sometimes wanna push off to the side of the road and say, you deserve this. So God, help us be the kind of people that reflect who you are body that we are created in your image to reflect your goodness. God, that's how we overcome the evil in the world.
that we live. God, we love you and we praise you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. My encouragement for you this morning is to engage with the heart of the Father. That as the, the team leads us here in a minute, just singing out praise of the goodness of who God is, that you might stand and just soak in praising and, and, and adoring your Father. We're going to have members of our prayer team that will be up here at the front. That if you want to come and just be praying over, like, hey, I, I don't do a very good job reflecting the goodness of who God is. And I need, I need prayers for strength, for patience for willingness to follow after the characteristics of God. We've got people on our prayer team that would love to, to come and pray over you. But here's, here's what I want you to walk out with this morning, is how are you choosing today to go and do likewise, to be that reflection in the glory of who God is? So as our prayer team comes up to the front, I'm gonna invite you to stand. And we're just gonna praise God for who he is to go and do likewise.